Hello, my name is Mike Klein. I'm the River Science Coordinator with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources River Management Program. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about river dynamics, sharing the science of how rivers continually change and evolve in a process scientists have termed dynamic equilibrium. It is a growing knowledge of how rivers work that is giving the Vermont River Management Program and river resource agencies throughout the country a new perspective about the river changes wrought by human hands in the past and the options that lie ahead as we try to work with rivers into the future. Over the last two centuries, European settlement has established an expectation that rivers are static in the environment. The phrase river stability meant that rivers should be in the same place tomorrow as they are today. People's livelihoods came to depend on it and the government encouraged and financed river management so that they would remain in the same place over time, drain efficiently, stay within their banks, and work to support commerce, energy production, and transportation. This was an attempt to create stability for human investments by fixing and harnessing the rivers. Rivers were straightened and armored to accommodate early settlement, roads, railroads, agriculture, log drives, and mill races. Land use expectations, including early deforestation, created an escalating and expensive cycle between flood-related erosion and redoubled efforts to dredge, berm, and armor the rivers back into place. Vermont suffered five major floods during the 1990s, and the repeated failure of flood remediation practices brought to the public's attention the need to find new ways for resolving the conflicts between rivers and human investments. Coincident with this need was the emergence of the science of fluvial geomorphology that explained the dynamic nature of rivers as they work the landscape. Applying this science has given us a new perspective on the river's response to the last 150 years of traditional management and a new set of strategies for breaking the cycle with past practices. Two important concepts, dynamic equilibrium and channel evolution, provide an understanding of how rivers respond to both natural and human-induced changes in their channel, floodplain, and watershed. The work of rivers is to drain the watershed and transport sediment and debris. This is a balancing act because an efficient channel geometry for draining water may be counterposing to the efficient channel geometry for sediment and debris transport. Lane simplified this concept by using a balance to show the relationship between the shape of a stream and the processes or work required of the stream. Lane's balance shows that moving quantities of water and sediment may be in equilibrium when the power and energy of the stream to erode, as dictated by the depth and slope of the channel, is offset or countered by the resistance of the channel boundary, which is the materials that make up the bed and banks of the stream. We can understand the balance between energy grade and boundary resistance in a particular stream by studying its geometry, including channel dimension, pattern, and profile, as well as studying channel bed and bank materials. Lane's balance allows us to understand the dynamic equilibrium of different stream types occurring in different valley settings. The mountain stream transports water and sediment and remains in equilibrium because the great power produced by the steeper gradient or slope is balanced by the resistance of the bedrock, cobbles, and boulders that comprise the bed and banks of these streams. A lower gradient, valley bottom stream transports water and sediment and remains in equilibrium when the power produced, more as a function of channel depth, is equally distributed and minimized along the longitudinal profile so that it does not become so powerful in any one place as to overcome the lesser resistance of the finer grain materials that comprise the bed and banks of the stream. 
Lane's balance allows us to predict the types of adjustments the channel is likely to experience in response to changes associated with either side of the scale. In the mountain stream, if a large flood occurs or encroachments in stormwater combine to deepen the channel, the increase in power may overcome the resistance of the bed, even a coarse grain bed, and the stream will erode down in a process called degradation. The same degradation process is common in the valley bottom streams that have been straightened, bermed, and armored. These practices resulted in an increase in power that easily overcomes the resistance of, say, the gravel is typical in a low gradient stream bed. This stream is not only transporting more sediment than it is storing, but has become a source of new sediment, all of which is headed downstream. Downstream of the degrading reach, the balance swings the other way as increased sediment supply overcomes the transport capacity of the lower gradient channel, leading to sediment deposition filling the channel in a process called aggradation. A researcher by the name of Shum observed and predicted channel response to disturbance and gave us a second model of channel evolution that shows the process a stream will undergo when it becomes unstable and then moves through a series of vertical and lateral adjustments to reestablish equilibrium. A vertically adjusting stream, especially one that has eroded down, results in a series of changes in the relationship between the active channel and its floodplain. The loss of floodplain connection results in the containment of flood flows and the eventual erosion of riverbanks until a new floodplain is created at a lower elevation. Channel evolution may involve changes which are difficult to observe unless you are looking at the river system at the watershed scale. Adjustments may take decades depending on the frequency of floods, often spanning several generations of adjacent landowners. The span of time is particularly important because vertical adjustments can change the overall slope and length of the channel and result in a loss of stream meanders. Along a straightened river, our short memory span makes it difficult to comprehend the valley space that was once occupied by the river and its meanders. Managing rivers to achieve equilibrium presents a very great challenge to landowners, watershed organizations, and state and local governments because we will have to consider how land use changes modify the quantities of flow, sediment, and debris, thereby tipping the balance, and how changes to meander patterns, floodplains, and riparian areas have modified channel geometry and thereby the efficient transport of these watershed materials. We will also have to understand that for rivers to effectively transport the materials produced in their watershed, they must have space to express the physical imperatives that govern them. If we move away from the idea that rivers are static systems by managing and protecting river corridors, then in the long term, we will reduce erosion-related conflicts, increase the storage of sediment and nutrient in the land rather than in the lake, and enhance the ecological values associated with river systems. And finally, perhaps the greatest challenge is posed by understanding the time it may take years or even decades for some rivers to go through the channel evolution process that is underway in river systems throughout Vermont. Nonetheless, our best option is to manage rivers toward their equilibrium condition because we now know that working against the physical imperatives of a river as it adjusts to maintain or reestablish equilibrium has been ineffective and counterproductive to the goals of reducing flood hazards and sediment and nutrient loading. Applying the science of fluvial geomorphology, using incentives and managing rivers to have the geometry, space, boundary conditions, and floodplain to achieve equilibrium is our best opportunity to minimize erosion over time.